The uh, therapeutic use of psychedelics, which I think was one of the topics, I don't know if he's here anymore, uh, that we're, we're talking about. Because uh, the two areas that seem to get a lot of attention uh, is intractable uh, conditions, like PTSD and dying. Those are the two areas most successfully treated uh, that uh, research allows now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about using MDMA as an adjunct to psychotherapy, okay? And I, I think that a way to kind of conceptualize it is that it is the catalyzation of, of the therapeutic process. And by catalyzation, I mean it kind of speeds it up. You know, therapy takes a long time. Uh, Insight-oriented therapy can take years. And here we have something that in a couple of sessions, you can get relief from your symptoms. So I think that's pretty profound when you consider that 22 service men and women kill themselves a day, okay? So if we have something that can uh, give you relief in two sessions, I think it's uh, unconscionable that this is not available. So I want to give you a little bit of a psychedelic overview. Basically, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to have the classical hallucinogens, just to give you an idea of what that's about, and then MDMA, which is what I'm going to focus on. So when we talk about the classical hallucinogens, we're talking about psilocybin, a.k.a. magic mushrooms, right? And LSD, mescaline, uh, and uh, dimethyltryptamine, which people are ingesting in the ayahuasca ceremonies that you've probably heard a lot about. As Dr. Robert said, these are serotonergic psychedelics because they mimic the serotonin molecule uh, and, that, and the areas of the brain that it's involved in. So what does that mean? Uh, it, the areas modified are the frontal lobes, right, the, the front part of your brain, which has to do with thinking, the limbic system, which uh, deals with the emotional states, uh, and finally the visual and auditory cortices, which kind of gives you the circus, the trippiness of, uh, of psychedelics. Uh, and what is, what is it like to be on serotonergic psychedelics? This is from a trip report. You think differently, and many times things that normally seem important are no longer important. And this is what Dr. Roberts had referred to. This is where psychedelics got a bad name in the 60s. It became paired with the dirty hippies and uh, people that were against the Vietnam War. Uh, now fast forward to where we're at now and how far have we come, right? So at low doses, colors are more vibrant. Uh, nature looks very nice. Music is appealing. Uh, hanging out with people is, makes you feel good. So that's in a low dose. Uh, a medium dose triggers open and closed eyes visuals. Uh, also, it starts to invoke a more of a philosophical component. So as the dose increases, uh, you are also opening yourself up to more philosophical and abstract conceptualizations, because at the lower doses, you're more into the, the eye candy uh, of the trip. And then at high doses, at a high dose, it can cause objects to take on living characteristics. I always like to say that the walls breathe. Um, causes more intense closed and open-eyed visuals as, the, uh, uh, as compared to the lower doses. And then a deeper understanding of things. It can cause a feeling of oneness with the universe. Now that's a pretty strange concept. It certainly was in the 60s. What, what are we talking about? So you, you, can, see <clears throat> you can see how it uh, got some of the bad rap that it had gotten. Now MDMA is considered a psychedelic from the standpoint uh, of the overall kind of umbrella, but it doesn't really fall into a category uh, like, like the classical hallucinogens that I just talked about. Uh, basically, MDMA causes neurons to release both serotonin and dopamine. And the, there's a caveat here that you can get serotonergic toxicity at higher doses. So too much serotonin is not a good thing. And that's sometimes what happens with, with kids that are ingesting too much MDMA and they're taking uh, serotonergic uh, prescriptions and then they end up with serotonergic toxicity. So that's something uh, that you have to be aware of and careful of. 
And so what does it feel like to be on MDMA? This too is from a trip report. Feelings of extreme joy and contentedness with feelings of empathy and good feelings coupled with waves of euphoria and happiness rushing through your body like a pulsating internal energy. It's also a sensory enhancer, so tactile senses, the sense of touch is greatly enhanced. So I have a short, I have a, about a 15 minute video here that kind of puts this into perspective. Uh, there's some, these are like case histories of people that have, uh, have PTSD and have gotten some relief from uh, using MDMA. But I don't believe that there's going to be anything that's going to take away your PTSD. Because every time you start talking about all this bullshit yeah, that we've been talking about in this room, my fucking memory banks just start flooding back in. Right. I had to live with it for such a long time, and I tried to wash it out of my mind. <laughs> I tried fucking everything. Well, and it's nothing that you're going to forget. I got in the Army when I was 19, and uh, 1964, and I was in, in country in 65 and 66, Vietnam, as a helicopter mechanic. One of my best friends, I saw him decapitated by a helicopter blade, and that, that was the one that got me. I think I was 22 when I got out. And, you know, I, I knew something was not right emotionally, and I couldn't put my finger on it. PTSD is basically a collection of symptoms that happen to people after a traumatic event, such as sexual abuse, rape, war, accidents, that kind of thing. And it can be really debilitating for people. There's a significant incidence of suicide, and there's a lot of suffering and disability that comes from living with that. Someone described PTSD as like having a big broken heart. And I think that's a pretty good description. You bury those emotions that make you human. Well, historically, the treatments weren't terribly effective. Um, a lot of supportive counseling, a lot of groups discussing feelings. And what's far better is treatments that involve uh, exposure. Depending on what literature you look at, probably around half the people are not well served. There's also pharmacology. Zoloft and Paxil and other medications kind of help to decrease the intensity of symptoms like anxiety, but they don't tend to get at the root of the problem and really cure, cure the disorder. I got to the point where I had so many drugs, I just put them in a big bag and threw them away. I said, I, I don't want to be drugged for the rest of my life. I was kind of, I say desperate, I just wanted to do something. A friend of mine had committed suicide, and uh, I was just tired of kind of carrying the baggage. And uh, I, I saw this clip on CNN. This is the place where we do the study, this is where we meet with people, and then this is where we do the MDMA sessions. Intense psychotherapy, including eight-hour sessions after taking a capsule of MDMA, of ecstasy. MDMA is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. It produces a reduction of activity in the amygdala, the fear processing part of the brain. It enhances activity in the frontal cortex where people put things in context. It releases oxytocin and prolactin, which are hormones of bonding and affiliation and love. And the remarkable thing that we've learned about memory is that when you remember something, you have to reconsolidate the memory. You're basically recreating the memory so that if this memory is linked to fear and under the influence of MDMA, you can bring back the memory, but the fear response is dampened down. Then when you reconsolidate the memory, it doesn't have that fear to it. And you've been able to put it in context as then and not now. Well, it's certainly understandable that people don't necessarily realize that this could be a, a potential therapeutic tool. A lot of people don't know the history. Most people don't understand that MDMA 
really began as a therapy drug in the um, middle 70s and early 80s. And then from that, some people realized that they could make a lot of money selling it in more uh, recreational settings and more public settings. And so it was just inevitable that there would be a crackdown. The conclusion of the administrative law judge that did the DEA hearings was that it did have medical utility and it should be in Schedule 3, meaning you can't sell it in bars, but doctors can use it. And the DEA administrator overruled that and put it in Schedule 1 anyway. And I felt it was important that we look into this further. No, no controlled research had been done. We designed a study in which people would have eight-hour all-day sessions with me and Annie in which we'd give them MDMA and then spend the day with them, helping them process what came up. I had a, a very chaotic childhood and because of that I was exposed to you know a lot of random abuse, sexual abuse. As a child I had a lot of symptoms. I was anxious, I had sleeplessness, I had vomiting, irritable bowels, but I didn't get any real medical attention until I was like 20. Conventional psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, rapid eye movement therapy, drugs and medication, anything that came through, I would try it with complete abandon. And it seemed like the more I tried, I would uncover more and more stuff, would come up to the surface, and then I, it would start to just get worse. The first study was inactive placebo compared to MDMA. So some people got inactive placebo with all the same therapy, the same all-day sessions, the exact same approach. I got placebo, so I was not changed, even though this was the best of the best of the best. I knew that I could come back and I would be getting the medicine two months later. Now that's when everything changed. Well, in our first study, basically in a nutshell, 25% of the people that got the therapy with placebo were basically free from PTSD at the end compared to 83% with MDMA. So 83% no longer met criteria for PTSD. There's a thing called a CAPS score that rates how sick you are. After this last treatment, he did, we did my CAPS evaluation. I came back for the two month follow up to do the CAPS to see what the results of it were. And he comes back and he sits down and he says, Rachel, you don't have post-traumatic stress disorder anymore. You don't have it. When I first heard about the studies, I signed up right away and I was like, I got to thinking about it. I mean, it was like 2,400 miles of logistics. There's cost involved. Uh, then I broke it down. I said, well, what do you got ecstasy and therapist? Hell, I live next to college town. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, you know. The treatments that are, that are sold to us at the VA are are, are high in number and varied in legitimacy, and MDMA is one of them. If a veteran said, listen, I saw this on CNN, and this is something I really want to do, why aren't you offering it? It might work, but we don't have the data to support that. This was my own thing. Uh, you know, what they were doing was 2,400 miles away. I says, I've got to deal with what I have. And I didn't have any compunction about it whatsoever. Fortunately, I had a friend of mine's son. He had met some guy in Sacramento who was going down to Los Angeles to score a big bunch. And uh, I was able to get some, and uh, it worked out beautifully. The first time I did it, it's like, it's just this blanket of warmth and glowing. I just like felt alive again, in touch with my feelings and stuff. And, uh, the music, music was incredible under the influence. And after I did the first, the first session by myself, I was like, I felt a noticeable, noticeable difference.
then I got in touch with the, somebody I knew as a therapist, explained to them what I was trying to do. And then I did three three-hour sessions. And uh, it was extraordinary. I mean, it just like, you know, I, I did in what, three sessions I couldn't do in 30, 40 years. Well, right now we're in what the FDA calls phase two, which is a number of small studies. And then hopefully in a couple of years, we'll be able to move on to phase three, which means two to 300 people each in multiple sites. And you need two of those to then apply to FDA for approval as an indication, as a treatment. If it keeps going well, what we think is gonna happen is it would be approved, not that you can give a prescription and people can pick it up at the pharmacy, but that it could be, it would be approved for use in specially licensed clinics. Last year, the VA spent around five and a half billion dollars on disability payments for over 275,000 vets. They perceive this as a crisis. There's 22 vets on average committing suicide every day. So while the VA has certain therapies that they've developed, there's a pretty strong awareness that there's a substantial number of people for whom these therapies do not work. The best treatments are cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure. We know that these work. It's hard to then say, okay, now that we finally got something that is very effective in 65 to 80 percent of cases, let's try a, a, a far out type of treatment. If somebody were to come along with a treatment that has a lower side effect profile, lower attrition, same effect size, easier to do, well then we'll do that. What I fear though, and what I don't like to see, and what basically just pisses me off, is when people forego the effective evidence-based treatments for the peripheral type treatments that don't have any real evidence, they don't have a great outcome, and then they give up on any treatment. And that bothers me a lot, and that, that does happen sometimes. The real issue is, does this help people or not? And if it does, if they're suffering from PTSD and this is a tool that can help them, we should develop it. And even though there's a short-term cost that some people will seek it out on their own and may find impure drugs or not be sufficiently supported, that's not a reason not to develop it into a medicine. And in fact, it's a reason to develop it as quickly as possible. There is so much enthusiasm from medical students, residents, young therapists that are interested in this field. I mean, just in the last four years, I think the amount of enthusiasm and people wanting to do this and open to it has really changed. It's funny, I tell people about this and you know, the veterans and stuff like that, and it just, uh, it goes right over their head and that they don't understand it, but you know, it just, uh, I sure did, I picked up on it right away. And you know, if, when it starts, the word gets out, I think the things will change. So what's that, what are they treating them with now that you're studying? MDMA. Well, if they're looking at using MDMA to cure PTSD, basically. I don't think there's a cure, but that would be fun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there, there is a, it is. Where do we sign up? There is a cure. <laughs> So you can see the reaction that uh, uh, that they had to MDMA therapy. It's like some far out kind of therapy. It's not far out therapy. The mistake we made in the 60s is we went about it in a counterculture way. The way to do it now is to make it mainstream. You don't have to be a long haired hippie doing drugs. You can be a, a businessman, you can be a researcher, you can be a psychiatrist saving lives using psychedelics. So in order to understand how MDMA works, I want to talk about the symptoms of PTSD. It's, it's, these are some pretty dramatic symptoms that are very hard to treat. Uh, Mike Mithoffer touched on it in the video there. Basically, the amygdala is out of control. That emotion part of the brain 
is unable to be brought under the control of the, uh, the front part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex. So you've got this emotionality running uh, and this inability to kind of rein it in. <clears throat> the amygdala is the um, center for, for the emotional part of this reaction. It sets off a fight or flight response. Uh, and as I said, the, the front part, which is able to uh, analyze, think, and organize memory is impaired. So, th so that's what makes it difficult to work with people that have PTSD, because it, you're, you, you're kind of unable to get them to be able to work through and process uh, the trauma. So the specific symptoms are hyperarousal. So these are people that are, are always in a state of anxiety, hypervigilant. Uh, there's a high level of anxiety, sleep disturbances, uh, re-experiencing of traumatic experiences, intrusive memories, nightmares, flashbacks. Everybody is so concerned about this term flashbacks. Flashbacks is just merely unprocessed material. That's what it is. Everybody has flashbacks. You don't just get them from psychedelics. Uh, and then this avoidance response, which is part of the reaction to what's taking place internally. Um, emotional numbing and withdrawal. So it's hard to work with people that are in this state because they're withdrawn from any kind of processing. And it can also include disassociative symptoms, which is kind of a, uh, a survival mechanism. I think it's well put to describe PTSD victims as people that are unable to leave the past and at the same time they're unable to engage in the present. So they're kind of trapped somewhere in between. So stay tuned, it gets better. Conventional treatments that they talked about, the expert at the VA, he talked about prescription drugs, uh, the SSRIs, these basically suppress symptoms. So there's no processing, it's just suppression of symptoms. And then the therapies that are indicated for it are the exposure therapies. And exposure therapies means you expose the person to the traumatic um, thoughts and pictures with the hope that that will desensitize them to it, but it oftentimes doesn't. Uh, I always get the feeling that when you're doing this as somebody that has trauma, you're basically re-traumatizing him. So the conventional treatment is basically suppressing and re-traumatizing uh, the individual. Uh, MDMA-assisted therapy does combine medication and therapy. So it has that component. But as I said, it catalyzes the therapeutic process because it's all about the processing. It's not about suppressing and desensitizing. It's, it, it is about how you're able to process the trauma. So I'm going to get into that in some detail and talk about what some of the key elements of MDMA-assisted therapy are. Uh, the approach is non-directive. So you have to understand the therapist is not directing this. The, 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 Mike Midhoffer likes to refer to the people that are in, these, in this research as participants. They're not subjects, they're not patients, they're participants. They're participating in their own healing. So the therapist invites the person to look at things a different way. It's more of an in, in, invitation as opposed to um, directing something. And then this idea of encouraging the participant to trust their inner healing intelligence. The, the thing that the therapist works with the, uh, the uh, participant with before the therapy is to make them aware of that you have this inner healing potential in your body. And it's up to, it's up to you to kind of process that. Uh, so the processing of trauma is, as I said, is kind of paramount in this paradigm, and of course, being that you're dealing with a state of altered state of consciousness, you have to orient the participant to uh, uh, the preparation and orientation to the method itself. Uh, the set and the setting is very important, as we learned from the 60s. So the mindset, the environment, uh, and the drug, the drug dose, are very important. Support system is very essential, too. Uh, the therapist basically is looking to maximize, to catalyze the impact that MDMA 
has on this inner experience with the, with the uh, participant. Uh, also, somatic, uh, any kind of somatic manifestations of trauma are dealt with. So part of, part of having trauma is not just uh, things on a psychological level, but oftentimes there's a um, memory, a muscle memory that goes along with that. And part of the theory of using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is that you're also engaging the uh, somatic uh, part of that equation. And then the idea of having to convey to the participants the nature of the MDMA experience uh, and the fact that it's a nonlinear manner. This is not the conventional uh, way that things uh, occur in which it can help lead to healing. <clears throat> so the key elements uh, is, as I said earlier, guidance and redirection when appropriate. Uh, also tools are used to evoke um, emotional experience. So music plays a very big part in the therapy because the brain will follow the music and it, it, it works by entrainment. <clears throat> um, you set the music in the beginning to be relaxing and then as the experience deepens, the music starts to move toward a crescendo and then a resolution and then back to meditative state. So it kind of mirrors the, the pr uh, processing of the trauma. And then of course integration uh, post-session follow-up is very important. Uh, because you have to be able to anchor what you learned in a non-ordinary state of consciousness uh, with uh, consensual reality. Mike Midhoffer uh, says, the effects of MDMA appear to increase the likelihood that participants will be able to process their fears without emotionally or physically withdrawing from the therapeutic alliance which is the big problem. You have trust issues. People have been traumatized. So you, you take this medicine, because that's what it is, and then the effects of it is to decrease fear in the amygdala and to do, increase the neocortical functioning. So the very part that is suppressed and activated by the, by the uh, trauma is what's dealt with as, as part of the uh, side effects, so to speak, of MDMA. The set and setting are made to be very conducive to the internal experience. Um, you wouldn't want to do this in a hospital room. That would be quite traumatic. Um, the setting is very comfortable. There's a reclining option so that you're very comfortable. Uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, art, flowers, artifacts from your own personal life to personalize the experience. Uh, and any kind of medical contingency, emergency, that's in place to, to take that out of the equation. And the music, which I mentioned, to support and deepen the process. And the music is very carefully picked for this to last the duration of the uh, experience. And then the therapist's diet is present. You have Mike Midhoffer and his wife. So you have a male and a female therapist on either side of the participant. Uh, that's what it looks like. They showed that in the video. You can see it's very uh, relaxing, comfortable earth tones. <clears throat> so the responsibility of the therapist is basically to follow and facilitate rather than direct. So this is more of kind of like a sitter. It's a whole different concept. So it's not you, the almighty therapist, you know, who makes a pronouncement uh, and gives it to the client for homework, this is a participant doing the work that you're helping them do. Completely different uh, paradigm. So again, promoting the inner healing intelligence of the participants is key. And this idea to move toward psychological and emotional homeostasis. Because your body, your emotions, your psyche are driven to reach that homeostatic state. And the, it's very analogous to the way doctors heal physical injuries. They don't actually heal it, but if you have an open wound, they'll clean it out, and then it'll allow the body to heal itself. So that's the analogy that the uh, psychedelic therapist uh, is using when he's working with a participant. 
because there he's helping the participant deal with anything that comes up as, as it comes up, but the participant is still doing the work. Uh, inviting rather than directing is a, is a, a key uh, aspect of that. Uh, it's both empathic and uh, rapport and presence, so you have to be very attuned to the client because they're in a, a heightened state of, uh, Mike Midhoffer talked about that, oxytocin for bonding and uh, prolactin. So the therapist is, re is relaxed but actively engaged. Uh, the verbal encouragements are minimal. Uh, the therapist admits that he doesn't have the answers, but invites the client to, to refer to their inner intelligence and trust their own conclusions. Uh, the verbal techniques are very similar to what's used in motivational interviewing, saying, well, we encourage you to take a look at it from this point of view, or this might be a good time to examine, and so forth. So it can facilitate a transpersonal experience, something that transcends uh, consensual reality, a different mind-body state, as, as Dr. Roberts talked about. Uh, the disassociative states that take place as a result of this are acknowledged and treated as part of the multiplistic psyche. So it's not just one level, but many levels. And the key here is to work with the material rather than to pathologize it. Uh, part of the idea of uh, working with the physical part, uh, psychedelics have been referred to as psychointegrators, uh, psychointegrators of mind and body. It's a way to integrate them. So a way to alleviate some of the uh, physical uh, constraints, uh, physical reactions to the trauma, is to breathe into the, uh, to breathe into the emotion and to move. Uh, the emotions are described as being about fluid movement and the trauma as being about frozen movement. Uh, Mike Mithoffer said that a lot of times he was able to get clients to get release by having them press against his hands just for release, just for that, for that part that uh, psychological en endeavors doesn't necessarily take into account. So what we're doing is we're connecting the psychological and the physiological. Uh, the participant is encouraged to allow the body to react to past traumatic events and not to fight it. So the idea is to go with the experience. Uh, therapy is not always pleasant. It's mostly not pleasant. And so it's, it's the same with uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. The memories that this brings up, you're encouraged to go with them, don't suppress them breathe into it, uh, and go past it. Uh, working with core materials and changing core beliefs can transform the participant's way of being in the world. I said earlier that people with PTSD can't escape the past and can't live in the present. So by being able to experience and process and change their core beliefs, they have a different way of being with the world. Not some, of some withdrawn person, unable to uh, integrate and process. Uh, Matt Baggett, who did research at the University of Chicago lab here on psychedelics uh, with Harriet DeWitt, uh, I met him and talked to him. He said, MDMA may not blunt fear and anxiety, but may make one less threatened by them and able to move forward. So that's kind of key to what's held people back in with the uh, PTSD. This idea of um, being constricted and not being able to process it. You have to address any fears or concerns. There's a lot of misinformation about psychedelics. The whole scheduling system is kind of suspect, as you're all aware. So you have to kind of uh, re-educate uh, the participants. Identify a social support network and what their role is, because that's very important for the aftercare. Make participants aware that there may possibly be an increase in negative symptoms. Again, this also is a side effect of therapy. So there's nothing wrong with having bad and negative emotions <clears throat> and not to suppress them. We can't all be the happy, smiling, bouncing ball of Zoloft, okay? It just doesn't work that way. And I think that it does people a disservice to think that that's how your life should be. 
So inquire about whether to include a family member in the early session. And you also have to teach and educate the participant about how a non-ordinary state of consciousness could be beneficial. As Dr. Roberts said, back when we were in school, the yoga and the meditation people were considered the, the guys that hung out with the acid heads. So, and now uh, meditation, mindfulness therapy, yoga, all these are considered very legitimate healing states. But it took us some decades to get through that part. Uh, and then, of course, warning the participant that they could be very vulnerable after this experience. So be careful who you open yourself up to and what you say. So it's just kind of like a caveat. So, how, so what happens? MDMA is administered to the participant. The protocol calls for 125 milligrams of, of pure pharmaceutical MDMA. Not ecstasy on the street, not molly. We're talking about pure pharmaceutical MDMA, 125 milligrams, followed by 62 and a half milligrams two hours later. The participant is guided toward a relaxed state. They're encouraged to recline on the futon with the headphones to start directing the experience in eye shades so you're not getting caught up in the circus of, of what happens with the visual cortices. You relax into the selected music. Uh, the participant is encouraged to, to, be, to, uh, to be open to the unfolding of what happens and not to uh, suppress it. And then you have periods of inner and outer focus uh, as the participants' needs are, need to be met. If you need to talk to the therapist, you take off your headset and you lift up your eye shades and, and they're right there to talk. And then, and then you go back internal. So you're the one doing the work. They're sitting there with you to help you process this whenever you need to. Uh, as part of the protocol, the therapist checks in after the first hour. That's just before uh, and prior to the effects, the peak effects of MDMA. And then based on the response of the participant, the participant is encouraged to either go deeper or to spend some time talking to the therapist. Again, as I said, in case of tension or blocks, the uh, participant is encouraged to move spontaneously to get some somatic relief. And if the participant appears distressed, the therapist redirects them, uh, advising them to surrender control and not fight it. Uh, and fully, ex fully express the feelings. There may be some consensual body work uh, necessary, again, with the permission of the participant. Uh, could include holding somebody's hand, you know, a gentle rub on the shoulder. Uh, that sort of thing is okay, but it's consensual. Um, the participants are, in, are supported in processing the negative effects of MDMA, and this is kind of the crux of what the therapy is about. So you process the negative effects of the trauma in the context of the softening effects of MDMA. So the side effects of taking MDMA is increased trust, intimacy, empathy, and forgiveness. And that includes forgiving yourself, too. So in this, in this perfect storm of a state, you have the negative effects of the trauma coming out when you feel safe. Oftentimes, these participants, this is the first time they felt safe in their body since the trauma. And then, as Mike said, you can use it as a template going forward. Uh, a significant other may be invited to attend, of course, depending on what the participant wants. Uh, at the end of the first session, there's a 90-minute follow-up the morning after the experiential session uh, to start the processing. And the participant is encouraged to work through the experience, through writing, uh, or artwork. Dreams are also noted. It may impact uh, some of your dreams. It may change abruptly. Uh, there are several more integrated sessions, integrative sessions, before the next session. Uh, the protocol uh, shows relief after three sessions. The next part of the research is to see if there's relief after two sessions. Because think about it, uh, after three sessions, not to meet the criteria for PTSD is pretty significant. I don't know of any other therapeutic modality that can claim that. Uh, and so the, the additional sessions are weeks later. What, what happens is there's this kind of an afterglow period where there's more processing done. So part of the aftercare uh, consists in uh, sessions several weeks later. 
uh, after the experience. And Mike's in, in the book that Dr. Roberts referred to, an acid test, uh, said it's about letting things happen, not grasping. You can trust the same inner healing intelligence that gave you the experience if you create space for it. It will keep working for you. Stan Groff liked to say it's about changing life from a boxing match to surfing. You may wipe out in the impact zone, but you're not constantly getting punched in the face, which I think is, is kind of a good way of putting it. So you're basically surfing the waves of your emotions to resolution, even if you end up crashing. But it's better than getting punched in the face. Uh, these are some of the results Dr. Mithoffer uh, talked about in the video. 100% uh, of the participants uh, experienced PTSD. Uh, psychotherapy alone, you can see that uh, most of, you know, you're talking about 80% of the people were still meeting the criteria for PTSD, uh, whereas with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, less than 25% met the criteria. Uh, the CAP scores that they refer to, the interesting thing uh, as they do the follow-up is before treatment uh, it was up to 80, two months after treatment it dropped to somewhere in the low 30s, and then three and a half years later after treatment it still was dropping, and it was you know about 25 as far as CAP. So the processing that went on after the experience continues. So in conclusion, I think this is a great quote and a great way to look at it. What you're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is something that may change the practice of psychotherapy to a scale akin to what has followed in medicine after the discovery of antibiotics. You know, we're on the threshold of a very massive paradigm shift to how we treat PTSD, uh, and uh, it'll, it should happen in, in our lifetime. Couldn't pass up the chance. Uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to meet and talk to uh, Ann and Mike Mithoffer at the first psychedelic conference that uh, I presented at in San Jose. Uh, sold out conference, 90 speakers. Uh, it continues to be of great interest uh, uh, worldwide.